something funny tonight. But yesterday and today haven't left me smiling too much. Then I thought, I'll start with something serious. But there are too many serious things to mention. <laughs> so before I think of anything else, let me simply say I'm so glad that we're here together to enjoy meeting, if you haven't already met her, Lydia Koo, currently sitting on the Palo Alto City Council and also running as a candidate for her seat. But first, here is our extraordinary moderator, Jeanette Kiesling. Oh, thank you, Freda. You make me plush and I finally probably have the color I need to be on, on the screen. <laughs> uh, well, welcome everyone who is on tonight, um, especially welcome council member Lydia Ku. Thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight and tell us more about your campaign and uh, what you hope to accomplish when you're reelected. So as everybody know who was on there before, um, this forum is one where we give Lydia about five to 10 minutes time to talk about herself and then jump into a Q&A. You can ask uh, your questions in the chat forum um, because we keep everyone muted throughout this meeting. So um, the only way to pose a question to Lydia will be through the chat forum. I'll read it off to Lydia and she'll then answer it. So, let me start with giving a little bit of background on Councilwoman Ku. Um, you have been, uh, you were born in Hong Kong, I should rather say, and raised in Sudan and Guam. So you've lived um, in the world, so to speak, <laughs> and you came here about two dec decades ago. I believe you live in the Barron Park neighborhood currently. Um, you've been a neighborhood volunteer with a focus on emergency preparedness before you became a city council member four years ago. You're also a real estate agent, and as such, you know this housing market real well. Um, housing in Palo Alto is, of course, one of the biggest issues, and we will return to that once we hear more from you. So I would like to uh, turn over to you now for your introduction of yourself. We're very happy to hear more of uh, the things that you would like to do in the next four years. Oh, thank you so much, Jeanette, and good evening to everybody. Um, I think Jeanette has already mentioned that I, uh, I was uh, born in Hong Kong to Shanghainese parents and uh, moved to Sudan and Guam. I came here to the United States, um, we called it mainland uh, in Guam, in 1988. And uh, when I arrived here, we basically purchased a little small business. It was a video store. In your neck of the woods, actually, in Evergreen, it was on 2123 El Camino Real, right next to the Ananda Church. And we owned it for about 10 years. And, um, you know, it, it's a mom and pop store. I had people who would come over at Christmas time and give me um, fruitcake, which, you know what? I loved. I love fruitcake. And people would say, whoa, but I love fruitcake. So, Thank you very much. And some of you might have been my customers back then. But anyway, like Jeanette said, I did move on to become a realtor. And um, I hope you don't hold that against me, uh, but you will let my civic experience um, um, be my track record. I've been in, uh, involved in volunteering and chairing different committees, including a program called the Realtor uh, Service Volunteer Program. It's an annual program to help seniors with safety maintenance and upkeep to keep and to help the seniors stay in their own homes. Um, Karen, who is here, Karen McNay may know about that. Um, I was a trustee with the Silicon Valley Realtors Charitable Foundation to raise money to benefit children and schools. Within my own community, uh, I coach middle school girls volleyball. I served as a PTA vice president and also as co-chair of the Palo Alto Unified School District's Measure A parcel tax campaign. Um, I chaired uh, our neighborhood's cultural diversity committee and also um, started and organized the annual movie night, movie at the park night. So it's very community oriented and bringing the community together. As Jeanette said, I did one of my biggest feats 
and I actually am very, very proud of it, is that I chaired my neighborhood's emergency preparedness and safety committee. But then from there, I helped lead, lead the emergency uh, preparedness program citywide alongside the city staff, which then became a city program now called the Emergency Services Volunteer Program. Um, I was serving uh, prior to becoming a council member as a citizen advisory committee, committee member of the city's comprehensive plan update, um, which I had considerable concerns about. It was a path to greater growth with little to no concrete method to mitigate the cumulative negative impacts. The mitigations uh, listed in the comprehensive plan <clears throat> was very aspirational, which led me to lead, which led me to run for city council. Um, at the time, you know, our um, city started becoming to look like a, to function more like a office park rather than, uh, you know, a hometown. Uh, you know, our, where families live, where school was very important to us, and we were starting to lose a lot of our community serving businesses. I don't know if you remember Shady Lane, University Arts, uh, those were uh, in downtown. Then there's, of course, my favorite dim sum place, uh, Mr. Chow's on Univers on California Avenue, as, long, as well as Village uh, Stationers, also on California Avenue. So the character of the city was starting to change. And oftentimes the city council and city staff were ignoring the input of residents on policies and projects and didn't heed the needs and the priorities of the residents. Um, Palo Alto is our home. Many of us moved here and have heavily invested into Palo Alto because it's a city with high quality schools, family oriented community. And it has it also provided great services, um, but through time, there were uh, unmanageable traffic conditions, parking issues, um, lack of code enforcement, uh, as well as the use and building violations. We were losing our tree canopy, and there and our park space uh, was starting to get more and more impacted, and we were getting less and less community center space. Um, at the time, there was a overcrowding at schools, but um, my understanding in my interaction since becoming a council member is that our elementary schools are not as impacted, but our high schools are still very uh, overcrowded. Um, so, you know, the main concern at the time when I, run, when I ran was also the culture with the city's halls planning process, which indulges in let's get creative flights of fancy. Uh, and I see too much shallow and narrow analysis, which doesn't take into account consequences that are readily apparent to the residents here. Um, we live it, we're boots on the ground, we feel it. And so those are some of the issues that I, um, that I ran on. Bottom line, it is the overwhelming number of developments approved in the past couple of decades that has brought us to this juncture. However, now we're dealt with a reckoning with COVID-19 and it has been devastating in so many aspects. Uh, we're, not dealing, um, we're not dealing with many of the impacts that I mentioned earlier. However, it does not mean that it will not return and we have to prepare for it. Uh, but at this time, you know, it's, it's actually very valuable time to measure and revisit the vision for the city and what residents have come to realize is important to us, especially now. Um, we also have to look at economic, uh, economic recovery. Uh, our businesses, especially a lot of our small and uh, community serving businesses are dealt a very huge blow. I'm not quite sure if, they're not quite sure if they can recover. And we want to we want to focus on seeing what we can do in order to make it sustainable and viable to have community services, community serving businesses return. Um, our also our city community services for residents. There's a lot of um, concerns over there because of the budget cuts. You know, sometimes when I walk around, I see a lot of our rubbish bins 
in the parks that are overfilled and it's not being collected. Um, there are also certain uh, roadways where trash is just strewn along the way. And those are some of the things that we need to kind of uh, pay attention to and ensure that we don't go onto the wayside just because of budget cuts. We have to keep focus on what is important. Um, pest control is another one. I don't know if you've seen that there might be an increase. While our uh, natural environment has been booming, so has our animal population. And we have those that we want to have around and we're looking for their flowers. But then we also have a lot of rodents now that we have to kind of worry about. So we want to make sure that we have that also uh, in our, in our, uh, to keep track of. Um, we should be concerned about uh, rents, um, especially for businesses. Um, a, a, a lot of the storefronts now are empty and I am concerned about that, but uh, I don't, I think that there is a rush in some of the things I've been reading, uh, both in the newspaper and in staff reports that speaks about changing uh, our retail ordinances. Uh, and I don't think that that's perhaps necessary without revisiting or visiting rent, um, revisiting rents, um, because I think rents are still pretty high. Uh, there isn't a, um, uh, revisit on that. Um, so, um, so I think that's the main things that I would like to look at as we go forward. Um, and I would be happy to be open to questions. Thank you so much, Lydia. That was a good introduction for us. Um, let me start off. It's a little bit early in the program to give praise, but let me start off with two, um, comments. Uh, one is from Sophie Tsang, who you I'm sure know. She says, Lydia, we love realtors. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and from Karen McNay, who says, I had the privilege of working with Lydia and her husband, John, for many years, and she's one of the most ethical and sincere people I have known. She really cares about the city and the people who live here. Thank so, you. After all this praise, we're going to go in some more difficult areas now. Let me start off with the housing issue, like I um, pointed out earlier when we prepared for this. Um, I think uh, it is one of your biggest issues, if I research correctly. Um, you have been called a residentialist who is in favor of a very slow growth. And um, there's actually one question that is very much related to that. It's from Kathy and she asks, can you discuss your approach to the SB 50 bill as well as affordable housing in the city of Palo Alto? Also, can you discuss your approach to what some call missing middle housing? So she's following up with um, one other aspect that you might wanna tie in with this. Can Lydia discuss the recent news of Patrick James Manswear clothing shutting down in town and country? Um, I'm not familiar with that, so um, maybe you are. Uh, but my, uh, the first point is, um, if you could explain your housing position, which uh, seems to me is, like I said, one of your biggest issues. Um, yeah, housing is a big issue. I wouldn't say it's one of my biggest because there's so many different aspects that makes a community. Housing certainly is one that makes, uh, that is one of the aspects, but I think there needs to be a balance. And, you know, um, I know the news and there is that uh, perception that speaks about me as a slow growth and, um, and a residentialist. I would actually like to call myself pro-resident because I am very much um, looking for the well-being of our community for the residents who live here because at the end of the day, when all the business people have gone home, we remain here. So this is our home. And I, I'm looking for a balanced approach so that when we are living here in Palo Alto, we have all the necessary things um, um, necessary uh, aspects that make our quality of life rich and our, and that there is a safe and health, that it is a safe and healthy community. So I'm looking for that balance here. Um, 
So I just wanted to address that first. Now, in terms of housing, right, um, to Kathy's question about my approach to SB 50 bill, uh, as well as affordable housing, SB 50 was a highly, was a um, very impactful bill, which was going to create high density. A lot of the high density uh, is going to be along, along places that they um, uh, have drawn out to be um, uh, rich transit areas, um, high resource areas, good schools areas. But then the thing is, most of the housing that they're proposing to build are going to be um, five to seven stories. And it was going to be very, very high density. Um, and all rentals. So with, um, with rentals, it doesn't provide people stability, number one. And then number two, they were going to be at luxury rates, so at very high market rates. When I researched um, the Carmel Village over on the corner of San Antonio and El Camino, those two bedrooms were going for over $4,500 to $5,000 per month. Two bedrooms. And... Um, that's, that's, that's for higher income and nowhere in SB 50, the Senate bill SB 50, does it state that they want to have affordable housing for uh, the ones that are going to be below the 80% area median income. Um, in a lot of these Senate bills, um, not only SB 50, but a slew of over 200 that was introduced uh, back then in 19, no, in 2019. Um, all of those bills, if they do address affordable housing, their definition of affordable is up to 150% AMI, area medium in income. 150% AMI is about 170K. This is a person earning 170K. That's not low income. You know, so, so if you give the developer the choice of building affordable up to 150% AMI, of course the developer is going to choose to build that. Uh, in another... Another way to look at SB 50 is also, if that was going to be passed, it was going to enable our um, uh, Plan Bay area. It was going to weaponize the Plan Bay area, ABAG, and also our regional housing allocation numbers and punish cities who are not reaching their uh, housing numbers. And by punishing us, they're going to streamline and basically take away our local control and streamline everything, our permit process, so that the developer gets to say what they're going to build, what they want to see there. And they could potentially say they want much more higher density. They want mixed use, which means part of it is going to have office space in order to offset the housing. They're going to have a little bit of retail they're not going to have enough parking space in order to accommodate everybody who's living there. And they're going to basically just kind of say that, you know, because we're near transportation, then they don't need all the cars. And we have not proven that people will not drive. And now that we're in the COVID era, era um, there, everybody feels a lot more safer in their own cars than taking public transportation. So there's a lot of wait and see uh, and, and to work or to, to revisit this in a year, not doing things right now. Um, so I hope I answered Kathy's question. Um, in regards to Patrick James men's wear clothing shutdown. I'm sorry, I don't know about that one. I don't either, so um, I think we're just going to let that go unless um, uh, Kathy wants to tell us more about that. I, but I guess what she is trying to find out is that there have been quite a few shutdowns in town and country. Right. Of course, the biggest being Mayfield Bakery and Mayfield Restaurant. So if this continues on, you know, that is a, a very central area of, of Palo Alto living. 
I don't know um, if, if that is an issue for city council, but obviously it is something that concerns the citizens if you have a lot of empty stores in town and country. Right. And, and you know what? Um, I'm, I may not know about Patrick James men's wear uh, clothing, but it does segue into, um, into our economic situation right now because of COVID, right? And I don't think that we should stop and not do anything. I think this is the perfect time to invest into, into, uh, into developing a strategic economic recovery. And by that, we, um, we used to, Palo Alto before my time, had a um, economic uh, economic person who look who um, uh, who look economic development director, but I would actually prefer to see an economic development specialist who will come in and actually analyze and and actually look into communicating and engaging the community to see what is it that the community would support and invest in terms of um, businesses, community serving businesses, personal services, what are some of the things that the community wants? And then from there, develop a plan in order to market out and do market research and to also uh, um, develop a plan to, to, um, to encourage businesses to come to Palo Alto. Because now we're at this place where we can start a new and and in doing that, in doing that, we don't we the property owners will not get to dictate what goes into their space. We get to say what we would like to see, and with that, perhaps rent can be more balanced instead of being looking instead of being high and only encouraging offices to come in and use it. And we might be able to entice and uh, encourage some of our startup businesses to come back because a lot of the startups cannot afford to start up in Palo Alto anymore because of all these big, big offices that have increased all our rents. So I think that it's an opportunity for us to look at, um, uh, you know, economic development um, um, within this year to research, uh, to analyze it too. So uh, let me just close the housing uh, questions with two more follow-ups. One is, how do you juggle being a real estate agent and obviously being interested in high housing prices because that is, this is how you make your, your money? And being a city council member who is interested in um, accommodating uh, or building low-income housing especially. How do you juggle that? I know I, in my research it showed that you have been criticized for this. Um, one Twitter post read, you can complain about gentrification and then go and list homes in East Palo Alto for millions of dollars. So how do you react to that? How, what is your position? How do you juggle those two? And then I'd like to follow up with um, a question from Sophie Tseng, which probably ties into that. Lydia, Silicon Valley Association of Realtors is recommending Greg Tanaka for Palo Alto. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Mm -hmm. So um, to, to go back to your original question, the first one, how do I, how I, how do I balance the two? First and foremost, um, market prices are set by sellers and buyers. It's not set by me. So, uh, and, you know, I can go to East Palo Alto East Palo Alto prices are set by sellers and buyers. It's by market forces. If I had that power to set prices, oh my, you know, but I don't. I don't have that power to do that. Yep. You know, I mean. If you demand low, then um, there you go. That, if say you, that again. I'm sorry. If you, can, if you keep the demand high, then the prices are going to stay high. So by not building more, I, I guess I'm just following up on this argument. I'm not saying this is my opinion, but I tried to clarify what this means. Oh, I, I can say, I can talk about that. So a lot of people think that if you build a lot and a lot of housing, there will be the trickle down economics and that would cause housing to cost less. It doesn't, it hasn't worked at any time. I mean, if you look at all the years, 
prices have continued to go up on, on housing, especially for sale housing. No matter how much you build, it's not going to cause prices to go down because you can never build enough. And at the same time, when you're building housing, you're not controlling the office growth, you're not controlling the commercial growth. That is also going, continuing to rise up. So as long as there's more people coming here because of work, they're going to want more housing. But housing can't, it doesn't, it, it, it the trickle down, the filtering or the trickle down economics on housing, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Now in COVID, even during COVID, housing prices, we still seeing housing prices continue to rise or stay steady. And on top of that, that's for sale housing. However, the rental market has gone down. And that is because people have decided that they're going to move away from here and they can go and buy a house somewhere else with bigger land, larger land, more space, and also cheaper prices. So why not? I in, in July, we've sold three houses because people want to move some, to something bigger. And I've also had people move away from Palo Alto to go to Santa Cruz because now they can have a house that is not as expensive and on the beach. So, you know, I mean, so to think that um, uh, affordability and trickle down works is a, it, it's a wrong ideology. It's, it's, um, it's a wrong ideology. Um, I also wanted to say that um, even, so that doesn't only apply to housing, even on the economics of um, uh, you give tax breaks to all those big companies and, you know, they will, you know, in the effect, you know, be more willing to um, share their wealth. That hasn't happened either. Every time they share something, a share a amount, just like when Facebook decided to um, uh, allocate some of their funds, five million or so to towards affordable housing, a lot of it was already allocated for the land. So when you start subtra uh, subtracting the land value and the research value, it comes down to peanuts towards actually building the unit. And when I talk about affordable housing, I'm actually talking about the housing that is below 80%. Most of those are gonna have to be subsidized um, by, by somebody and usually it's by government, which is why um, a couple of years ago, we were, I was working with Mountain View who had some, some folks in Mountain View who had, uh, were instrumental in passing their business tax. And, um, and then later on, we introduced it to council and council decided to take it on. The finance committee took it on and then it came to council and we voted to move it forward. Um, because through that, um, the business tax, um, we could at the time look into um, funding transportation, funding affordable housing. And at the time, I was also looking at perhaps um, a small percentage of it can be uh, reinvested into businesses, especially the community serving businesses. Um, but that never came to fruition even though we started the research on that simply because of COVID and with businesses hit hard right now, we wanted to make sure that we explored it a little bit further and just had a more understanding of where we're going to be in a year's time. Okay. Um, so let's move on to the question that Sophie Chang had, namely the Silicon Valley Association of Realtors. Um, like I said, they recommended Craig Tanaka for city council and um, Sophie would like to hear your comments on that. Oh, so I actually, um, you know, Silicon Valley Association of Realtors is also my, uh, my um, organization. I'm actually a member of it too, because I'm a realtor. Um, but I do disagree with their um, platform. And um, I did not go for the endorsement. I have not taken endorsement uh, from most of the uh, larger organizations from the Democratic, from the Sa Santa Clara County Democratic Party. 
I haven't taken the endorsement from the League of Conservation Voters. I haven't taken uh, most of the endorsements from all of these uh, organizations. And the reason is because I don't feel that um, I'm working for the people of Palo Alto, and I don't think that I need their endorsements to work for the people of Palo Alto. Uh, and uh, frankly, I am not ready to take their, um, their stance on matters uh, without deliberating it further, finding out what the people of Palo Alto wants. Um, and um, I, I feel that with that, it's a better representation of Palo Altans. Um, the only uh, organization that I did take a, take a um, uh, endorsement from is Sierra Club. And with Sierra Club, um, I, I am very big about nature and trees. So um, the natural environment is very important to me. Um, and so Sierra Club was something that I really appreciated getting endorsement on. Yes. And I'm sorry, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Tanaka can have their endorsement. <laughs> all right, let's move to a topic that is really dear to all of us here in Southgate. Um, and I think a lot of people here are from Southgate. Um, uh, as you know, uh, City Council will be uh, approaching the issue of great separation. And um, I'm sure you're familiar with the several options around the table. If not, we have Susan Newman in our group who can <laughs> give you a speedy update on this. But um, what is your position on that? What do you do? You follow the, do you have a preference? Are you willing to talk to us about that? Um, I will not go straight into, you know, I can't talk about a preference uh, at this time. If I should be reelected, I would love to be able to vote, to, to provide a vote. Um, I do follow the XCAP, so um, I do call into the meetings. Sometimes it overlaps with another meeting and I might have to, um, I might have to leave it to attend the other meeting. Um, but I do go back and watch the YouTube videos and try to catch up on them and see where they're at. I'm very aware of the uh, recommendation um, that came up um, with a 6-3 vote, I believe it was. Um, uh, I also, uh, as I said, was part of the comp plan update. So there are transportation uh, programs and um, goals that we should follow. Um, but of course, sometimes um, staff do pick, uh, cherry pick some of those comp plan programs and goals. And as a council member, uh, it's up to me to keep it true to what we had decided on the comp plan. And equity throughout the entire city is very important to me. Traffic congestion has always been a problem. And right now we may not have that traffic congestion or traffic flow issues, but it will come back. And we have to think about that in the future, not just for now, not just for now. Um, so I hope that answers it. Well, I'm, I must say, I heard that answer from several other candidates. And then I was thinking to myself, so maybe this is something special to the American system here. I don't know. But um, how come you cannot tell us about your position about the great separation? I mean, you, you are asking us to give you your vote. So pretty much what that says is we're giving you our vote without knowing what your issue is on great separation. Um, I. I so in the American system, I, you know, my understanding is there is um, giving my position right now might uh, favor, might be a way to turn uh, other council members or other um, um, uh, people who has perhaps um, some authority for for formulating their opinion and if they know what i'm gonna say i might be able to change their mind um so 
it's oftentimes told by the attorney that um, we should refrain from speaking too much about a certain um, uh, item that we might have influence over, especially if we're going to vote on it. Um, I think it. I think it applies to the Brown Act, um, but um, I will tell you at the very beginning, having come from Hong Kong, I mean, having visited Hong Kong quite a few times and gone back to Shanghai to visit my mother, um, the subway uh, underground, undergrounding the train was, a, was, was what I wanted to see. Um, and I was hoping that we could, I actually put it back onto the alternatives for them to um, uh, revisit and to analyze. And they did. And um, they shelved it now. So at the end of the day, it's what people are choosing, uh, what they want to do or what they would like to see and what um, they didn't, um, or what they thought might be too expensive. Um, but I thought, you know, with our transportation system, it's going to be a long time um, matter and need. And so, and if we're really looking for people to use public transportation and to get out of their cars, then we're going to have to have a robust and sustainable system that runs well. And that is not going to cause traffic congestion or safety issues, uh, uh, especially because we have four at great areas. Um, but my choice in my heart, even though I introduced it, um, was, was um, not part of the solution. So at the end of the day, um, uh, I would hope that um, based on some of my track record that you would um, trust and have confidence in me to choose the, to be voting and to be looking and deliberating for the right solution. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, equity is a big part of it and to ensure that our uh, quality of life as well as, and quality of life includes um, noise, um, uh, low frequency vibrations. Um, there's a lot of factors so that comes into quality of life. And I hope that you would trust that I will make the right um, choice. Um, I'm not the only one who finds that somehow um, interesting or strange because um, that is certainly a question that stands out um, among all the other questions because you could argue any other issue that you vote on in the future could be treated the same way, yet nobody was shy about giving their opinion. Um, this is the very one that people are not, or you can't, your competitors are also not um, willing to give an opinion on. And I find that a little bit disturbing, but um, let me just uh, um, read to you what some other people say on the very issue. Um, so I understand why candidates can and shouldn't express right now why what they prefer, but should council wait on a decision on great separation right now is what Abby Pratsky would like to know. I might have butchered that question a little bit, Abby. Um, uh, could you ask, Susan Newman is asking, could you ask Lydia to clarify the advice from the city attorney to not express an opinion on the issue? I didn't understand what the legal issue would be. So that goes in, into the direction I um, laid out earlier. And then Susie Grover says, I watched Creo Stone's session. He did not express his opinion either for the same reason that he would have to recuse himself from the vote on the issue if he um, shared where exactly he stood. You see, you know, as a feedback to, from this meeting maybe, you see that people really would like to have an opinion. They would like to know who they vote for and what, ex this is a very important issue for all of Paul. Oh, yeah. So I think we, we, we should actually know, you know, who we vote for. Um, Anyway, so it was a, a concrete question from Rishma saying, please be clear, should the council wait on a decision on great separation? I believe that question is um, probably due to the changes of COVID-19. And Abby Pratsky would like to know the same thing. I would also like an answer. Um, should the council wait on a decision on great separation? 
Let me go want, can you repeat? You want an answer to council? Could the council wait on making a decision about great separation? Because and this is what I'm adding to this question, because obviously through COVID-19, things have changed quite a bit. We're not sure if it goes back to where it was before, if we actually need that many trains, um, if maybe for the next couple of years, you know, it'll remain the way it is now or is a slightly different version of what it was before. So would you argue that council should wait to make a decision if they could? Um, yes, if they could, they should. Although we also want to um, be in sync with Caltrain and what are they doing. If they're going to start increasing their services, um, even though they have a lot of financial difficulties at this point and it has put forth a tax on the November ballot, but we have to kind of uh, be at the same deliberations as Caltrain is, what their business plan is going to be and how soon are they going to roll out. Now, they are still moving forward on the 2022 for their electrification and to start running their trains. If that's the case, we need to kind of look at um, how, how many of their trains are going to be running. And also we're going to have to look at where is the um, economy at that point and what are the, uh, how, how high are the uses. And, you know, going forward, we, we might have to make a decision because we're going to, we might have to decide now in order to plan for what is going to happen in a few years time. We can't do it when we find out what are, how, what is the capacity on the trains, whether it's low or high. So there needs to be some planning. It doesn't happen overnight, you know, to build this whole thing. Um, it does take time to plan it out. And then there's still the, the environmental impact report that needs to take place. So, um, so there's quite a few process down the line uh, and it doesn't, it, it might require, I'm not saying that, uh, that we, certainly there's, there's an opportunity to wait, but I think that we have a few more things to look at, a few more items to look at what Caltrain is doing, what HSR is doing, and how fast are they coming along whether their business plan is indeed going to move forward, uh, what is their operational data. Uh, so there's a lot more to look at before I can say we can postpone. Okay, let's move on to a question from Rishma Singh. Um, how have you worked with XCAP in the current term? Have they been effective? How do you intend to work with the XCAP on this issue in the future? And then maybe uh, let's follow this up with um, a question from Susan Newman. How seriously do you think council should take a recommendation from XCAP, especially having listened to the deliberations? Let's put that in quotes. I'm sorry, can you say that again? There was a, there, it seems like there's a lot of questions in there. How seriously? How seriously do you think council should take a recommendation from XCAP? So basically what both want to know is how well have you worked with XCAP on this issue in the past and going forward, how will you work with them and how seriously will you take their recommendation once you are making, once you're going into deliberation at city council? Well, you know, the XCAP has done a tremendous job in reviewing all the different technical technicalities uh, and I have, I have not worked with them because, I mean, I watch the video, but I don't work with them. Um, so they have gone through their deliberations. They have uh, brought in um, experts in order to provide um, information for them to use in their deliberations. And I think that, you know, it was actually very um, informative for me as well when, when the experts are talking. Um, They've also questioned the experts when some of the when some of their analysis came back, especially with the traffic counts and traffic circulation. So I've appreciated that as well. Um, on their recommendation, um, on their recommendation, 
it's not going it, to, I will have to, <laughs> I, I don't like the last recommendation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I don't like the last recommendation, but I appreciate them bringing the recommendation and um, we'll have to see what the council says, but I'll tell you I don't like the recommendation. <laughs> Why? Hmm? Why do you not like the recommendation? It's not equitable. Can you explain a little bit more? Um, no, I cannot explain a little bit. I, I don't know how to... I don't know how to make it a, uh, I don't know how to make it so that it won't be held against me. Okay. Fair uh -huh. enough. So let's move on to a last question maybe. Um, and it's pretty much actually a comment from Susan Newman on this issue. Is Lydia aware that Caltrain is planning a two-year study of great separation approaches up and down the corridor and that the outcome of those deliberations could affect Caltrain standards? The ability to formulate a multi-city great separation approach that could attract federal funding because it has a wider effect. How do you feel about the representativeness, representativeness of the XCAP membership? Maybe you can just answer that one question for Susan. About Caltrain and its two-year planning? Yes, I'm, I'm act I've uh, actually been the, um, the representative of council to the um, LPMG, which is the Local Policy Makers Group for Caltrain. I was um, the representative in 2019, so I went through their entire business plan planning, going to the board, getting all the approvals and passing the business plan. Then this year, I am the alternate. Um, the mayor is the representative, um, but when he's absent, I go. And when he's not absent, I still listen because I don't, I don't know when is the next time I have to go and I don't want to have a a break in there where I'm catching up. And yes, I am aware that after some pressure and after some of the, um, some possibility that they could lose all funding and actually not run their trains, they, they have kind of decided that they're going to revisit uh, and have a study of their great, of some of the great separations and even perhaps help with some of the great separations and look into, uh, you know, they said that they might even look into financing and so forth. But when I asked a little bit more about the financing, they were, they said that they were actually going to look into how much it was going to cost to help us figure out how much it was going to cost. Whether they were going to help us with any financing is a complete different question. Um, so yes, I'm still following that. Um, Sebastian Betty, Petty from um, Caltrain, you know, still working on it. So um, uh, I'm, I'm keeping tap on it. Okay, let's move on to another issue that is, I know from the past um, uh, forums we had, um, is very dear to people and that is Foothills Park. And I know you um, just, I think you talked about this in the council. You, maybe you wanna tell us, um, because you were there and I wasn't, what your position, or the council position rather, is on Foothills Park and opening it up for the general public or keeping it closed. The only Palo Altans could go there. Um, so I was the council member who m made the motion to take it to the people of Palo Alto, put it on the ballot for the people of Palo Alto to vote on, for them to decide whether they should open it to um, um, to the region, to the state, or they would like to keep it as a park for Palo Altans. Um, I feel that, I feel that, um, um, that we're the, so a very wise person told me this quote, that we are the custodians of the present uh, and guardians of the past. The past my predecessor council members or residents of Palo Alto were the ones who decided to keep the park for Palo Altans. And I think that I should, as a council member today, I should honor that and also respect 
the people of Palo Alto who decided to keep the park for Palo Altans. Uh, along the way, that decision has made Foothills Park an uh, incredible preserve. It, it's it's um, during the COVID when we were sheltering in place, um, the pictures that I saw um, of the wildlife that has come back out and grazing, just, you know, hopping around, walking around, flying around, just was incredible. And I'm not quite sure what it's going to do to that wildlife if, um, if we have a lot of people coming to the park. Uh, additionally, more, more people coming to the park um, the soils, they get compacted, and then it means our vegetation is going to have a harder time um, regrowing in, in that area. Um, yeah, so I really want to honor our predece uh, predecessors who had the for forward thinking of protecting some of our open space. Um, so I did put forth that we should look into a ballot measure, you know, for, for the residents of Palo Alto to decide whether they want to open it or not. Um, in terms of, um, you know, um, some of the um, people that have decided that um, it's racist or it's segregationist in not opening the park, um, I want to say um, that it's distracting. It's distracting from what the real, it, the, the, the matter at hand that they want to really um, address. It distracts from that message. So, um, because um, any Palo Alton of any race, of any sex, of any income, can go to the park. So, um, yeah. Thank you for the answer. Um, can you tell us why this might be a technical issue? Why is it on the ballot for twenty ballot for twenty two and not for this year's? Oh, um, it's so when it came to council, it, there was only a few days for the cutoff to to put it onto the ballot, and there's just not enough time for the legal language, for the notification, etc. Um, and uh, so it would be for 2022, that's why. However, I do want to say that the attorney, when I brought that up, um, did say that with a new council, um, at this point, yes, you know, that's what we are, what I have said in my motion is for 2022. However, the new council can choose not to put it onto the ballot. Uh, in 2022, if the if that council chooses not to um, move forward with it, I like to move on to maybe our last um, question that we can, or our last topic that we can move into tonight. Um, and it's a question from Susan Newman. An issue that has emerged in meetings with other candidates is the role of the city manager, not only in managing operational issues, but in setting and steering the city's agenda. Is this concern that you share? If so, what do you think can or should be done about it? Um, yes, the city manager and the mayor um, determines a lot of times the agenda. And, you know, um, the city manager knows what needs to come to council, time sensitive, etc. And of course, the mayor has a big role in it as well. Um, I think that there is um, there is some problems with that because there are also other areas that doesn't come to council often enough. For example, you know, I had a colleague's memo, um, which is about um, housing. Um, one of them was the Palmer fix, which is for um, which is when uh, people are developing apartments for rent housing, uh, that there should be inclusionary housing in their low-income units that could that should be uh, 
part of it. And um, so far, that hasn't come back to us, even though that uh, the Palma fix has happened for over for three years now, I believe, and that hasn't happened. So um, some of these items are just taking forever. Another thing would be the Plan Bay Area 2050 draft. You know, that has big impact on Palo Alto, yet that hasn't been part of the agenda brought forward so that we can visit it, that staff could bring it to us so that we can understand what was the methodology that went behind uh, formulating the number of housing that is needed here in Palo Alto and throughout the region. Another is all of the state bills and assembly bills that has been proposed every single year that affects and impacts each of our cities. But Cupertino visits, they have their, they have their lobbyists come in and provide an update of where that bill is every time it goes through a house. But it hasn't come to Palo Alto. We, our staff just follows every one of these things, regional, every one of these uh, plan or bills and just goes along with it until it has been passed and brings it back to us and say, okay, now we need to change our laws. We could write letters to affect that, but none of that has happened as a council on the whole. And that, has, that is part of um, something that I do have concerns about um, uh, with the city manager not bringing it forward. Um, another thing was on the budget. When we went through the budgets this year, um, the reports comes to, came to us very, very late. And in a way, I felt like I was, I was fighting with fire like on the fly, and that's not right. Um, and my understanding is, for example, also last night uh, for Planning and Transportation Commission, there was, they, were they were deliberating on the EIR for Castilea, and there was a 30-page memo or a 30-page staff report that was submitted at places. And so the planning and transportation commissioners were supposed to go through it and it did not go through to the general public in, with enough time for them to review. That's not right. This is not the way to do public engagement or public participation. Um, so, so yes, uh, I, I do think that there is some overreach. There actually not some, there is overreach, period. Thank you very much. Looking at the time, we have a couple of minutes left. And um, as is custom here, we would like to give you a couple of minutes to finish off and tell us um, once again, why should we vote for you? Maybe you also want to tell us um, we have three more votes to give out. Who else should we vote for? Who would you like to see as your colleague on city council? Um, but this is your time to just make your statement again. Why should we vote for you and not for your competitors? You can also present, um, tell us about your webpage and where we can go to support you if we would like to do that. Thank you, Tanette. So um, I, yeah, I do want to rebuild confidence and trust in City Hall, realign City Hall's vision with that of the residents and encourage and foster city uh, citizen in involvement. Um, <clears throat> I believe in moderate growth by thoroughly assessing the immediate and future impacts of each development to its local site and to the surrounding neighborhoods and to Palo Alto as a whole. Um, but let's not stop there. We also have to assess what our neighboring cities are doing and what their impacts will be to our city. I believe we have an inherent right to expect to have quiet enjoyment in our homes, in the community that we have decided to raise our children and invested in friendships and therefore present, uh, preserving the essential character of residential neighborhoods is most important. Um, let's recognize this. Residents are the core of our community. We have invested in our neighborhoods at our schools and we have greatly contributed to all the civic, civic activities that make a community healthy and co cohesive while supporting our strong economy, which is why the value of a city is in making living pleasant 
for acknowledging that relationships are the most basic need of humans and that infrastructure is for that purpose first and for supporting the economy second. I ask for your support and vote for me. Um, my um, website is www.lydiakou.com and um, it, I, it would be an honor if one of you would find uh, who supports me would look to um, consider putting on a meet and greet for me or lawn signs or go to my website for endorsements. We're also doing video endorsements. So if you'd like to do that, let me know. Um, and um, thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Ku, Lydia. Thank you for taking the time tonight to be with us and talking in depth about your, what you would like to achieve in the next four years. But I think you want to say something, right? You did ask the question, but some, who are the other <laughs> you might want to consider? <laughs> um, yeah, I would love for you to consider Greer Stone. Um, you know, he brings in a completely, um, unique aspect from the youth. Uh, they're a very important part of our community. Um, and, and it would be great to have him as a council member working with me if I'm lucky to be reelected. Um, and of course, there is Pat Burt. Um, he does have experience from the past when he was council member and uh, it would be great to work with him uh, and serve with him. Um, and another would be Planning and Transportation Commissioner Ed Lowing. Um, you know, he, he likes to um, um, come examine both sides and come in with a very um, uh, um, meaningful way. Um, and, it's, it's appreciated because we all are a little bit different and we can all learn from each other and, um, and uh, work with each other. Well, I'm, I'm glad the city lawyer didn't ask you to not talk about that issue. We finally got an answer out of someone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> so thank much, you Lydia. so much for asking. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me and organizing this uh, opportunity. Good luck on your campaign. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.